Hello, this is Homer Knox of MenTeachingMen.com. In this video, we're going to be reviewing Philippians chapter 4. The New American Standard and King James Version Bibles will be used for a scripture translation in this video. Hello, friends. This is Homer Knox at MenTeachingMen.com. In this video, we're going to be reviewing Philippians chapter 4, teaching on chapter 4. If you haven't done so, please allow me to suggest that you watch the other three videos on Philippians, an introduction, chapter 1, and chapter 2. And I've enclosed the links for that below. Philippians 4.1 Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Therefore, therefore, therefore means for that reason, as a consequence, as a result. Paul is saying, hey, reading my letter up to this point, this is what you should be doing. Therefore, therefore. We know from the previous chapters that the Apostle Paul longed to see the Philippian church. They were his joy. Did you ever have anyone that brought you joy? My wife, my sons, my grandsons, and several others are my joy, makes me happy and joyful just thinking about them. The Philippian church was the Apostle Paul's crown. When the heavenly rewards will be given out, Paul will certainly get a reward, a crown, for this church, as he was the founder of the Philippian church. The phrase, stand firm in the Lord, Paul uses this term eight times in the New Testament. If you put your feet in concrete, and let it harden. I don't do this. You will stand firm. Pressing into the Word of God will help you cement your feet into daily joy, daily joy. Not standing firm is called wavering. Hebrews 10.23 Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Our God is certainly a faithful God. He's a faithful God. And by reading the scriptures, we'll see that he has always been faithful. Verse 4, I urge Odious and I urge Synechi to live in harmony in the Lord. There seems to be a problem with the relationship of these two. We assume they are women, but one could be a man. As a new sandpaper Christian, I had problems with many. Well, now that I've grown in the Lord, and God has worked with me and helped me. Now many of my rough edges are smoother. Now I try to be in harmony with all in the church. If you are a sandpaper Christian like I was, keep growing in the Lord to smooth out those rough edges. You can do it with God. Verse 3. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle on the cause of the gospel, together with Clement, also in the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the Book of Life. Book of Life. Look for the link below for the interesting video teaching on the Book of Life. The Philippian church was founded by the Apostle Paul with the help of Lydia and the other women who were down at the river. Evidently, several women, Clement, and others assisted the Apostle Paul in his ministry to the Philippians. Several Bible scholars seem to think that Clement was a future bishop of Rome. It takes many believers to assist in a prospering church. If you're a believer, are you helping at your local church? Are you helping? Your body of believers needs you. Verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I will say, rejoice. Well, just another power-packed verse a commandment by the Apostle Paul. Rejoicing is a well of pure spring water on a dry earth. Rejoicing is a big theme in the Apostle Paul's writing, and it should be big in our lives. Since we are living in our temporary home, this earth, we might as well rejoice over our great God. We rejoice in you, Jesus. Good times, bad times, uncertain times. Rejoicing is our life preserver in a dark worldly sea. Verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. King James Version. 
Moderation is a quality that glorifies Jesus and edifies us. Mildness, patience, yieldingness, gentleness, clemency, moderation. These are absolutely great qualities. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all of our tombstones would mention these items about us when we pass? The Lord is at hand. It's a true statement. It's truer as every day goes by. It was used as a conversational saying between Christians in the early church. Verse 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Just another power-packed scripture and commandment from the Apostle Paul that myself and many others often fall short. But we can try to do better, try to do better daily. Don't worry about anything, nothing. Pray about everything. Praying helps us not to worry, doesn't it? Bad news, sickness, they affect most people. We're human. But no matter what the news, no matter what the report, our God, our precious God, is in control. So why should we worry? Since we can pray with thanksgiving and ask God to help, to remove it, to straighten it all out, or to give us the strength to endure it. Matthew 6, 8, For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. We can understand this because He is God, the maker of heaven and earth. Well then, if He knows what we need, why pray? Why pray? James 4, 2, You do not have because you do not ask. We are commanded to pray. God is on the throne, and He wants us to come to Him with our request in an attitude of what? An attitude of thanksgiving. Thank you, Jesus. There are many of our needs that are answered daily. Without prayer, I try to remember to pray every time I get into my car to drive. Sometimes I forget. And God has provided safety for me and my family. Our prayer goal should be to ask God for help with most, if not all, areas of our life. There are at least three answers we could receive in response to our prayers to God. Yes, I love that one. No, and maybe later. Maybe later. Maybe later. That's a hard one, isn't it? Maybe later. Verse 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension. King James uses understanding, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Well, what is the peace of God? The Bible says it surpasses all comprehension and it will guard our heart and our mind. I don't know about you, but I need my heart and my mind guarded, guarded. Isaiah 26.3 The steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in you. King James Version Trusting in God certainly has its rewards, being kept in what? In perfect peace. If you don't have peace today, start seeking our Savior. Do more spiritually until peace comes. And if peace doesn't come, possibly Christian counseling with a born-again man or woman of God would help. God wants to give you His peace. He wants to. Don't settle for anything else in your life but His peace. Psalm 118, 6. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Psalm 119, verse 165. Those who love your law have great peace, and nothing causes them to stumble. John 14, 27. Jesus is talking. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Well, another power-packed verse in this one. Let's forget about the past and our errors, which are many, and have our mind dwell on those things of excellence. Focusing on the things of excellence is just like walking through a beautiful garden with wonderful sights and smells. Negative thoughts need to be rejected. 
I'm not going to think about that. I've asked forgiveness. God has forgiven me. I've made restitution, and so I'm not thinking about negative thoughts. And these need to be replaced with thoughts of excellence. Verse 9, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Christian mentors are just wonderful, just wonderful, but many times they're difficult to obtain. The Paul-Timothy relationship was not available to me when I was a new Christian. In my ministry, I try to mentor men that I teach. The Apostle Paul says the God of peace will be with you when, number one, we have learned from Paul. We can do that through his writings, received his teaching. We can receive his teachings by faith, or we could reject his teaching. Heard and seen in Paul. We can't see Paul till we go to glory, but he still speaks to us through his letters. Number four, practice those areas that Paul has set as an example to us. Verse 10, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. The Apostle Paul rejoices that the Philippians certainly gave an offering, but also that they had great concern for him, great concern and love for the Apostle Paul. Verses 11 to 12, not that I speak from one, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Verse 12, I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Content in every circumstance. Just another great verse. What is the secret of being content? One of the secrets is found early in this chapter. Verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Adam Clark's Commentary I am so satisfied with the wise providence and goodness of God that I know whatever he determines is the best, and therefore I am perfectly contented that he should govern the world in that way which seems best to his godly wisdom. Paul says he learned this. Well, how did he learn it? You learn this by trusting God in the small matters and then moving to the larger matters. Trust grows and we depend on him as he meets our needs. Verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Psalm 1829, for by you I can run upon a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. Verse 14, nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. Verse 15, you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. Verse 16, For even in Thessalonia you sent a gift more than once for my needs. The Apostle Paul commends the Philippian church. Verse 17, Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account profit to their account. He's talking about the blessings that come from being faithful in our tithes and our offerings. Be faithful. Verse 10, And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Verse 18, But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied having received from Aphrodite what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Verse 19, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Supplies all my needs. As long as I've been a Christian, I can't ever remember my needs not being met. I remember when my wants weren't met, 
When I started to be faithful in tithes and offerings, then my wants started to be supplied. The closing of Paul's letter to the Philippians. Verse 20, Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 21, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. Verse 22, All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Verse 23, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirits. Why Caesar's household? In confinement in Rome, that was Paul's congregation. Summary of the Epistle to the Philippians Philippians is a letter written to the Philippian church by the Apostle Paul in approximately 60 AD from Roman confinement to the church he founded. The epistle to the Philippians can be summarized in one word, encouragement, encouragement. In this epistle or letter, Paul was encouraging the people of Philippi to live lives that were obedient to God and that are uplifting to one another, encouragement. Encouraging them to live in unity and harmony. How wonderful that this letter written 2,000 years ago can have meaning to us today. Thank you, the Apostle Paul, and thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Friends, at the end of this video, I have listed the many outstanding scriptures in this book of the Bible. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the Men Teaching Men YouTube channel. Hello friends, this is Homer Knox of menteachingmen.com. I hope you enjoyed this video teaching. The question I have for you is, are you born again? Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and are you saved? If not, why not? Why not? Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He suffered and died under Pontius Pilate and the Romans. He was buried and he rose from the dead on the third day after burial. He's ascended now and is seated at the right hand of the Father. There is salvation in no one else, no one else. So if this has stirred your heart and you'd like to become born again, you'd like to reserve a place in heaven for yourself, please pray with me. Dear Jesus, please forgive me of all my sins, all my sins. Come into my heart. Cleanse me with your precious blood. Cleanse me. Thank you for giving me new life. Thank you for giving me a place in heaven. Thank you for making me a new creature. And thank you for the Holy Spirit now leaving inside of me. Amen and amen, amen. If you prayed this prayer from your heart, you're now a Christian, you're now born again, welcome. Welcome to the family. If you prayed this prayer after slipping away, you're now back in the family, you're back in the fold. Congratulations, congratulations. There's another teaching on the menteachingmen.com website entitled, I Just Got Saved, Now What? And that video will help you in your new walk with Jesus Christ. And I've listed the link below for that video. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. A small sample of the many great verses in the epistle to the Philippians. Philippians 1.6 For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 1.18 What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Philippians 2.3 Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Philippians 2.14 Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Philippians 3, 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. Philippians 3, 9. More than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Philippians 3, 10. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. Philippians 3.14 I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call 
of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.4 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Philippians 4.6 Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Philippians 4.8 Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through him who strengthens me.